Hi, I'm Tom O'Connell. Welcome to the final installment of our series here at Eastside Freedom Library on the year 2020. And what a year it's been, the global pandemic and the economic crisis that has come with it, the mass protests around the death of George Floyd that brought with it a wider conversation and argument about racial inequality in the US. And we had a presidential election this year, which broke all sorts of records for voter participation and revealed once again, deep social and political divisions. In many ways, this year has been a stress test for democracy, but just how unique has 2020 really been? Are there historical parallels that can help us understand the moment we've been living through? And what does history tell us about the opportunities for racial and social justice in the immediate years ahead? Or maybe more modestly, what questions does history suggest we ask ourselves as we forge a new present. Joining us to explore these and other questions are three history profs who are deeply familiar with US history and applying that history to the underlying, uh, to the understanding and help us shape the world we live in and my glasses just fell out. Doug Rossenow is a professor of history at Metropolitan State University, my old stomping grounds. He is currently on leave from his teaching responsibilities to serve as Dean in that university's College of Liberal Arts. Doug has taught and written extensively in the field of U.S. history on subjects including the U.S. Vietnam War, religion and politics in American history, the Great Depression, the 1930s, and the 1980s. Shannon Smith is an associate professor of history at the College of St. Benedict's at St. John's University in Minnesota, where she teaches courses on the Civil War and Reconstruction in American culture, gender and race in U.S. history, and protest and rebellion. I first met ja uh, Shannon via Zoom when I tuned into her excellent presentation on the movement to take down and or reinterpret historic monuments. And then Jeff Kolnick is a professor at Southwest State University. He conducts regular summer institutes for K-12 educators and on teaching and the civil rights movement and has published an anthology of writings on Freedom Summer. Professor Kolnick also has a deep interest in rural history um, and including the populist and progressive traditions that are too often um, a hidden history, one that deserves retelling. So welcome to all you guys. And Shannon, that wasn't in my script. Let's just start with the kind of a little bit of an introductory question. And Jeff, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, as you think about this year, what are one or two or three things that come to mind? Sure, all of us was wondering who was going to go first on this one. <laughs> but uh, um, thank you for inviting me, and uh, hello to the fellow panelists. And what a great idea this is! So, I'll just list uh, three uh, that came to mind. One was, I think, the election of Kamala Harris as Vice President of the United States is uh, significant, and um, for many, many reasons, and um, uh, played a critical role in the election of uh, Joe Biden and, and obviously is path breaking for many, many reasons. So I'll just kind of leave it there. I, I think that um, the, uh, in 2020, you saw a kind of surfacing, you saw it somewhat earlier, but it manifested itself much more uh, intensely in 2020, the surfacing of above ground far right wing white supremacist militias. Uh, they, they've been around, they never went away, but the way that they've surfaced publicly uh, and kind of manifesting themselves in, you know, an attempted uh, or plotted kidnapping of a, of a sitting governor, the, the uh, shootings in Kenosha, Wisconsin and, and, uh, and elsewhere. I think that, uh, We'll be talking about that for a while, and it'll be interesting to see where, where that goes. And then um, the, I would say the, the other thing that to me, one of the other things that to me seems important is the extraordinary uptick in uh, um, the concentration of wealth at the very top as a result of the pandemic. That you, you've seen a lot of wealth just go to a tiny, tiny number of people um, and the complete inability of our political system to address that, you know? And so, I, so I'll leave plenty of room for the others to, to, to come up with three things as well. But those three things to me seem, um, uh, among many, seem 
not unique to 2020, but, but amplified mm. in 2020. Or maybe Kamala Harris is unique, but the other two. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Thanks. Yeah, you've given us a lot of grist to chew on as we, <laughs> as we continue. So, uh, Shannon, what, what do you think of as three things? Thanks. Yes. I, I'm also really happy to be here and, and have this conversation together. Uh, I am most interested, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this more, in just how widespread racial justice movements were mm. this year um, in very small towns, in every state in, uh, in the country. Um, many young people who were organizing, but often standing alone. Um, so really uh, sort of generational, willing to take some, some generational stands on racial justice. Um, and again, just the, the breadth of interracial participation, which we can talk about mm -hmm. patterns in the past, but just how widespread uh, this was in 2020. Um, I'm also interested in addressing just the, the deep cracks in our society that the pandemic revealed. Mm. Um, in this case, uh, not just the, the economic inequalities, but especially the gender differences, um, different than say the 2008 recession, this one's hitting women particularly hard um, in uh, various class aspects as well. Um, the number of uh, women who are now just leaving the workforce entirely because they need to be caring for others and that, um, you know, supervising children and education and how that can take on gendered aspects as well. Um, and especially the, the assumptions that our society has made about who is essential yep. in the workforce and what we are willing to pay people mm -hmm. for those essential services. Um, so that, that economic aspect stands out to me um, as well. And third, I would say the, the Supreme Court uh, mm -hmm. situation and with the, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the very quick nomination and uh, confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett as a culmination of this decades long process um, from the Republican Party in particular of shoring up judicial supremacy um, and judicial appointments at all levels of the judiciary, but now um, fulfilling that in the Supreme Court. Yeah. Thanks. Between the two of you, you've already listed enough things to have six shows, you know, and I'm sure we'll weave our way back into some of those themes. So Doug Rossino, how about you? What's your top three? Well, thanks, Tom. Um, it's great to be with you, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you know, with colleagues like Professor Smith and, and Kolnick, and uh, I've already learned a lot from the, the, the comments they've made in, in, a, in a brief span of time. These are, yeah, uh, we talk about these uh, all day long, all week long. Um, I'll try to mention some other things, and I'll be honest and tell you that the elections are still on my mind, mm. the elections of 2020, but not just as, as discrete events, but as culminations of 2020 and really as culminations of what you could call the whole Trump era, of the last four or five years. Uh, maybe the Trump era will last till 2024. Um, hmm. We'll see, we'll see, time will tell. Yeah. Um, just a, a few notes about, about the elections and how they, again, sort of culminate uh, certain trends we've been seeing. One is what I would say is the death of American exceptionalism. The idea that, that, that historians are very familiar with uh, goes back to deep into the Cold War era, the idea that American history is really somehow unique and particularly that it's really different from uh, European history in its characteristic ideologies. Uh, the notion that the yeah. United States lacked the, uh, uh, the class structure and thus the ideological extremes of, of Europe. Uh, and in the Trump era, how many times, how routine has it become for people to compare Trump to other uh, so-called populist leaders, I've called mm. them right-wing nationalist leaders around the world, whether it's Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary, um, Berlusconi, who used to be in power in Italy, Boris Johnson in the UK, people who are aspirants to power like Marine Le Pen in France. Uh, this kind of right-wing nationalism reasserting um, supposedly the, the, the power of the nation state and the saliency of national borders against transnational flows of labor and, and capital. Uh, it, 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 is, um, it, it is 
similar with, of course, national variations in, in so many places around the world. The United States doesn't stand apart mm. from, uh, from tendencies elsewhere. I, that, that's one insight, I think, as historians uh, we might recognize. Related to this second is uh, what I think you can call the revenge of the non-credentialed. Um, 70% of the American adult population does not have a bachelor's degree. Um, a fraction of that uh, non-credentialed majority has um, joined with conservative forces um, against the credentialed minority of 30% who rule over them. Uh, and uh, this, this often takes the form of the town versus country opposition that we see in, in our politics, both at the state level and at the national level. Uh, there are a lot of pieces that go into this. Uh, of course, Joe Biden managed to overcome Donald Trump in the presidential election. He really did. Uh, by the way, but if you look at the down ballot results overall, and then the election results of the last four years, you see uh, you see this this building trend that is persistent. I don't think it's over, and I think it's extended what I would call a kind of post cosmopolitan era, mm. uh, you know, with a rebellion against um, you know metropolitan cosmopolitanism, along with the transnational uh, and globalized world that everybody's experienced. Yeah. Uh, and the third point uh, I'll make briefly is that. I think for people on the left in particular, for progressives, uh, they have to revise uh, the uh, rigid framework of white nationalism as a way of understanding the Trump phenomenon and the, the larger political uh, trends that he you know, merely represents uh, and symbolizes. Uh, you know, we've had a, a great deal of very explicit uh, racism in our public life, our civic life over uh, the last several years, as, as my colleagues have already mentioned. And something we can talk about further. But I think we, if we want to understand, uh, take account of the full force of the right wing nationalism that really is present all over the world today, we have to understand it as a kind of flexible nationalism that can be deployed differently in different places for different purposes, sometimes in the form of white nationalism, sometimes perhaps in a form of nativism mm -hmm. that uh, has a more broad, actually multi ethnic appeal potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are those are a few observations I would make about what's been going on. Yeah. Well, thanks uh, to all of you for uh, introducing a lot of uh, themes and uh, issues. And one of the things I want to talk, and I'll, I'll start with you, Sharon, I'll kind of work our, our way around, Shannon. Um, we hear a lot about, and I've certainly been concerned about, division, um, red state, blue state, uh, country, uh, urban, white, uh, multiracial, um, and phrases like, this is the most divided we've ever been. What, what does history, American history in particular, teach us about social division? Are we really going through an unusually intense uh, time of division, or are there parallels that we should think about? Shannon? Thanks. I... Uh... I like to teach about the Civil War. So whenever <laughs> we say, we talk about, is this the most divided yes. we've ever been? And I can say, well, we've not yet formed armies and taken, you know, yeah. formed battle lines against our fellow Americans. Yep. Uh, as Jeff pointed out, some have um, mm -hmm. and are taking up arms to, uh, to form battle lines. But as a nation, we have not yet mm -hmm. gone to war over these issues. Um, and a big part of that is we're, we're all mixed up together. Uh, as much as we like to talk about the urban rural divide, uh, I've liked a lot of these maps that have come out after the election that show numbers of Trump voters in large cities and suburban areas, um, the very purple nature of most states um, where our red and blue map does not do mm. justice to um, to who actually lives in those states, how they are thinking, um, how they might align politically. Um, we've seen a lot more maps that demonstrate shifts from one party to another uh, from 2016 to 2020. Um, so I think there are a lot of, of great examples of how we actually are um, living all together. We can't have this north-south divide uh, of the Civil War era, um, but also that it does speak to these fears of the city. Um, mm. I, the idea of the revenge of the non-credentialed is outstanding. Mm. <laughs> Doug, thanks for introducing me to that excellent phrase. 
Mm -hmm. um, but also the, you know, if we talk about coastal elites, well, they're not all coastal and what do mm -hmm. coasts look like? And there are plenty of rural people who live in states um, along the coasts. And so uh, just these ongoing ideas about uh, strangers in the city, the city is a foreign or dangerous place. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely have seen those before. Yeah. Let me ask you, and I'll also ask Jeff, because both of you teach in, um, in um, colleges, universities, and that are located in um, rural America, small town um, rural America. Um, is, so I, I wonder, um, is there much connection with um, the surrounding communities? Uh, for example, with St. Ben, St. John's, um, or is it almost like going to this, you know, island as if, you could, you could be in uh, St. Paul where they already have six uh, colleges and universities and it wouldn't be different in your daily life. How do you think about it or do you think about that? Uh, I definitely drive by a lot of Trump flags on my way to <laughs> work every day. So um, I, I definitely feel we are in a rural area, but also again, because now we just have better access to information. You can drill down and see political donations by zip code. So mm -hmm. I, I've met more friends in my, or more people in my small town um, who had yard signs this year than I've ever seen mm -hmm. before. So I, again, like people, we're all living mixed up together, even though our social media and maybe the people we, we spend more time talking to might uh, align with us politically. Um, we are actually living alongside uh, people, you know, we have in in the small town of St. Joseph, Minnesota, uh, there are businesses that have taken stands about masks, both pro and anti, um, and patrons who have aligned themselves accordingly if they support masks or not. So we see these businesses even, um, and they are physically located right next to each other, but are taking very different positions, and therefore. The, their customers are aligning accordingly. So mm. it's, yes, I, I feel it in a small town. I don't know that it gives a great answer about like what, what who yeah. we actually look like. It's, it's yeah. hard to tell. Well, thanks. So Jeff Kolnick, you're in uh, Marshall, Minnesota. And what do you think about the level of social division that we hear so much about it? Unprecedented, worse than ever, um, except for the civil war, which is an excellent point. Um, how do you think about that? Well, yeah, I think Shannon did a great job of setting that out. I mean, this we were obviously more divided between 1848 and 1877 than we than we are now, and and uh, but that's not to say that the divisions are not are not great because uh, because they are. I I'll just say first about working in a in a small town. Uh, well, a regional center really is about thirteen thousand people. To get to a bigger city, you have to go 90 miles. But, but so it's a, it's a, um, it's pretty Trumpy. It, 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 it uh, Trump carried it with uh, more than 60, about 60 percent of the vote, a little bit more, 62, 63 percent of the vote. One of the more uh, Republican areas of the state. Uh, at the same time, as Shannon pointed out, nearly 40 percent of the people in that community are Democrats, and and and. Uh, and you just have to kind of recognize that. And I've known I've known them for years, you know. And 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 so the uh, and I would also say that people mix in churches. Uh, I don't personally because I'm not a church going kind of guy. But but uh, uh, there's a, a lot of people that get together in churches. Uh, parents that have kids that are on the same sports team. So there's a lot of people that know each other in these communities that live and work together. Uh, um, uh, at the same time, they they are highly organized uh, politically on both ends. So I would say that, um, uh, and there's, you know, the, the usual, I don't know what it was like in St. Joe, but there's vandalism of signs and the removal of signs and these kinds of things that occur, uh, you know, harassment of DFL pop-up tents, you know, that, that they did this year. But it, on the whole, I'd say that that people live and, and work together. And the same thing happened in the small towns uh, where I worked there, where the uh, the, maybe the only business in town is a sex station. And they took the masking signs off the walls after Trump was defeated. You know, the state mandated uh, uh, signs to wear masks are off these, you know, three Senex stations as you go up Highway uh, um, 59. 
So there is that kind of division. I would say as we move forward, uh, one thing I see that will likely change, uh, Shannon brought up the appointment of Amy, Amy Coney Barrett, which I think is also a, a monster issue. And, and, and that is that there's now a, looks to me like a pretty solid voting majority for social conservatism. I think that the conservative movement that's been, you know, dominating uh, American politics for the better since the 80s, really, uh, was delivering constantly on a kind of neoliberal economic model and just throwing an occasional bone to social conservatives. And I think social conservatives are about to win some big ones uh, over the next three to four years. And that is probably going to lead to an increase in street level uh, demonstrations from a variety of kinds of people. And, and, and likewise, if they don't deliver, <laughs> there'll be street level demonstrations too. So I think that, that the social conservatism, which is a wing of the conservative movement, uh, really took a back seat with regard to policy for many years. And it uh, looks like at the level of the courts, they're, they're about to, I think they're going to, they're going to assert themselves. So in terms of division, I see that increasing uh, um, probably over the next uh, 10 to 10 to 20 years. I, I just, I, I just see it increasing. Jeff, I'm going to start with uh, you on this and then work my way around. This, of course, has been a year of social protest, particularly around issues of racial justice. And um, many people see it as, you know, one of um, uh, the, the periodic sort of um, uprisings and uptick with uh, the struggle for uh, civil rights and um, African American, the African American freedom struggle. You've done a lot of work on uh, Freedom Summer. You've, uh, in addition to your teaching work with uh, K-12 educators on uh, teaching, you've got an anthology and on, on, um, writings from the era. How do you compare or think about this year's uh, campaigning and marching and um, educating around um, uh, racial inequality with, with some of the uh, eras in the past that you studied? Jeff? I think Shannon uh, brought up, you know, the, the the size, scope, and and the diverse nature of the protests, and I'll just leave what she said. That that's different. I mean, there's no doubt about that. The way, way, way more, just white people participating, brown people participating in a black in a black led movement, uh, and that had that that can be studied and, and and talked about at length. I want to share a story that uh, I learned, you know, when I was doing some work down in Mississippi. I was privilege to meet a guy named Obi Clark, and Obi Clark uh, served as the president of the Meridian NAACP for many, many years, and uh, um, we used to visit with him before he passed away, and, and uh, we went one time to Meridian as a field trip with, with a bunch of kids from, from uh, Jackson, and we met in the parlor of his funeral home, and uh, a uh, young uh, black man who was a basketball player from Provine High School uh, looked at Mr. Clark and said, you know, he said, man, nothing's changed. I, you talk about all this change in the 60s. I don't see any of it. There's just nothing that's changed. And uh, Mr. Clark, I cannot do justice to this story because uh, he was a master storyteller. But he said, well, he said, you know, and everything Mr. Clark talked about related back to the farm that he grew up on and these kind of rural experience that, that, that he came out of. And he said, you know, when I was a, a boy, uh, we had a, a coon dog and, and that dog would uh, only bark when it had treed a coon, you know, and, and, and then you would come out with, with at night, you would come out, my dad would come out with a gun and a light and the dog would be pointing at, at the coon in the tree and you would shine that light and you would have one shot at it. And if you missed, uh, you'd get away. And he looked at that uh, young man and he said, and that's the way I feel about racism, son. I haven't had a clear shot at it since 1965. You know, and I, and I think that, that, that what, we're, what we're dealing with now is a different kind of struggle than what we dealt with, uh, uh, not we, that, than what uh, civil rights veterans uh, dealt with in the, in the period between 45 and, and let's say 1970, in that uh, even the most crudely racist political figures, until Donald Trump, really, um, used dog whistles. And now, now, now you can get a clean. Now, now we get a clean shot at it again. And I don't, it's a good, it's a, I don't know whether I should be glad that Obi Clark hasn't witnessed uh, that, or or sad that he couldn't see that he'd have a clear shot at it again. Uh, 
But but um, so I would say that the, the principal difference is that that it's just really harder to to go after the enemy than, than it used to be. And uh, um, so the strategies that you're seeing develop, being developed by Black Lives Matter and by young people uh, borrowing on the techniques of uh, previous generations and really an intergenerational organizing meeting with veterans from the movement still. And uh, I think is, is really to me uh, uh, where we have to, what, what we really have to think about. How do you target a, a systems of, of oppressions that are now uh, pretending like they are like, like they are not racist or sexist or homophobic, you know. I think that's a challenge going forward. Although right now it's it's easier to aim at. Shannon, do you have thoughts about that? You you certainly studied and taught uh, about the civil rights era, for example, um, as well as your work on uh, studying about these uh, movements to um, take down or at least reinterpret monuments, some of which have to do with our uh, racist history. What, what are some of your observations about? parallels and differences? Sure. Um, I, I do think social media has changed so much and that has led to just how widespread uh, these movements were this summer um, and really drawing support from other regions where in the 1960s people would physically have to go there. Now there are different ways to rally support for causes, whether it's removing a monument or uh, you know, supporting a march of some sort. Um, I, uh, the downside of that is uh, the, the demonization that can take place in the media. I read a great piece about um, doing language analysis of comments on news channels um, and that the uh, viewers of Fox News talk about Black Lives Matter in the way that viewers of CNN talk about the Klan and they are using the same language frameworks to talk about them. So um, to, to uh, sort of disregard what, what the movements are actually about, but really fall into these tropes of, um, of who's the enemy and why I think can happen really quickly. Um, one thing I feel hopeful about, not only just, it was very inspirational to see just these massive numbers of people coming out, um, but I do think that we have more people in positions where they might be able to make policy differences um, and that there might be more support for actually changing some policies. Um, for better or for worse, you know, we also see a lot of movements to like criminalize uh, organizing protests and things like that. But um, I do, I do see hope for some policy changes. Um, we can see what comes of that. Uh, the the thing that I have found most helpful in recent years to talk about uh, a lot of these comes from the historian Ibram Kendi. And he talks about, like, this just blew my mind when I first read it, um, but he talks about racial progress being real. Like, ch things have changed since the 1960s. We cannot deny that. Mm -hmm. But also, racist progress is real. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than thinking of it as this form of progress and backlash, he speaks about them as sort of these, these two uh, forces that are moving ahead together. And I think what we've seen um, in, you know, people being much more open about uh, their, their no longer dog whistles, but actually saying things out loud, like th this is racist progress. These white supremacist groups, these domestic terrorist groups, like this is racist progress, finding new avenues, new ways uh, to reach some of the same goals that they're taking on very different forms in order to do that. So Doug, um, how do you see parallels and differences? Okay, well, first of all, I, yeah, I learned a lot already from the comments that, um, that Jeff and Shannon have, have, uh, have just made. Uh, and uh, I can only add to those a little bit, you know, just on the question of um, parallels to previous eras, you know, no era is exactly like another, there are always differences as well as similarities, but even putting aside yeah, the era of the Civil War when armies massed against one another on fields all over the, the country. Um, 
you know, there are certain periods in American history when partisan preference, partisan identification becomes a source of personal identity. Mm. Uh, and it's really, really, and it's palpable. And it's, you know, you see it now in which, you know, it, according to surveys, you know, probably more uh, Americans would be upset if their child married a member of another party than a member of another racial group, <laughs> um, you know, uh, which seems a little bit crazy, but then when you think about it yourself and you think, mm, well, yeah. mm. um, uh, you know, th- there have been times in the past when, when party has become this tremendous source of identity for Americans, even though, in retrospect, it may not seem to us like the, the, the policy differences were so profound. Uh, the best example probably is the first Gilded Age in the late 19th century. I say the first Gilded Age because we've been living in the second Gilded Age for a number of decades now, uh, an era of increasing inequality, uh, social disconnection. Uh, in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, it was a period of very tight partisan competition across the country between Democrats and Republicans. They, at that time, Americans thought those differences were really, really significant. Differences over uh, tight money or loose money policy, you know, creditors versus debtors. And it was really town versus country, again, just like it is today, except that the the party identifications were flipped. If you look at the um, electoral vote map of 1896, you can Google it. And um, it's stunning to see because it's mirror image of what we see today with all the areas that are blue today being red then and all the areas that are red today being blue then basically. Uh, The Republicans held the major metropolitan areas in the cities, the manufacturing centers. Uh, The Democrats dominated uh, in rural America, the deep south and the plains. Um, And uh, so that's where we were then, here's where we are now. Uh, There's some other periods like that too. Uh, On the question of uh, organizing for racial justice and, and protest movements, you know, I, I do think that, that um, as, as intellectuals, uh, we tend to get impatient with social movements about, you know, uh, why don't they have a strategy? Or why aren't they concerned about their messaging? Yeah, you know, because sometimes, the, I mean, these things matter. Uh, these things do matter. Um, but I think there's usually some kind of a delay, a lag between a surge of protest and then um, effects within the, the formal political system in terms of organizing and how the the, the, the themes and, and aims of the protest movement get channeled in a sense uh, into uh, party competition. I think several you know, years ago, more than a decade now, we saw Occupy Wall Street. Uh, and I think some people at that time were saying, well, gee, why can't these people just like try to make change in the political system and we could really use them? I think eventually you did see effects, mm-hmm. uh, follow on effects from that in party politics, mostly in the form of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, and I expect that down the road, we're going to see the, the protest surge of Black Lives Matter uh, with all its, its innovativeness, as well as its sense of history, as, as uh, my colleagues have noted, take some kind of more organized electoral, or not, not more organized, but a more electorally organized form. And I, I don't know what form that'll take. I think it'll have to probably be, again, a, something of an oppositional or uh, insurgent movement within the Democratic Party. Um, and um, I think to be successful, it'll have to be not just a cross racial appeal, but also it'll need to make a real cross class uh, appeal uh, to forestall the kind of increase uh, in support among people of color that Donald Trump realized in 2020 Hmm. versus his performance in 2016. So I'm gonna put your um, educators hat on, Um, not that it not hasn't been on, but um, one of the things that struck me um, is how much, and maybe it's just been my own little world, it seemed like there was a, a lot of emphasis or challenge for Americans to learn a little bit about um, the history and the history of racism and the history of um, movements for racial equality. Um, how is that in, How is that going um, in the institutions or communities where, where you work? Doug, you've been out of the classroom for a little bit, but I know that when I was at Metro, certainly there was ongoing, not always, um, well, it was peaceful, but contentious sort of uh, debate about the role of multiculturalism and racism and um, what we should be doing in the academy. You've been away for a while. Do you have any observations about um, how that wider discussion is going about race in America? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question, Tom. You're right, I have been out of the classroom a lot in the last several years. 
I was actually, in, until a couple of years ago, I was in Europe for three years, uh, which is kind of different, although they think it's more different than it is for America. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of racism there too, but it takes different forms yeah. on different axes. Um, a lot of post-colonial legacies that people don't necessarily want to confront, et cetera. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think that there, there is a, a, a lot of readiness among a lot of people, of eagerness to, to, to talk about uh, the history of racism in the United States. I mean, in a sense, it's become pervasive uh, in American civic life in the last one to two years even, but having that institutionalized, you know, is another matter. I think it, it happens at a kind of a, kind of a, a molecular level, uh, not necessarily through um, administrative plans. So I think a lot of educators are very committed to that. At Metropolitan State, I'll say we have a graduation requirement called the Racial Issues Graduation Requirement, which is basically an anti-racist education graduation requirement. I mean, it's really pretty, it, it's pretty innovative. Not that many uh, colleges and universities have such a requirement. So I, I think I think it is happening, but I mean, there's no doubt that there's um, there's much more that can be done, not just in terms of how much we talk about racism, but but how effectively mm -hmm. um, we talk about it. Yeah. How about you, Shannon? Um, what's going on in your classrooms there at St. Ben's, St. John's when you talk about this stuff? I do think um, for the most part, I would say students are, are willing to engage. Um, and we talk a lot in my classes, at least about how we need to practice talking about race that I think uh, for students, but really just for everyone in the country, people are very concerned about speaking. Well, that was dramatic. Our conversation with historians Jeff Kolnick, Doug Ross now, and Shannon Smith literally ended in mid-sentence when the power went out uh, here at the Eastside Freedom Library and in the immediate Eastside neighborhood. So we had to uh, stop the program there. It was the uh, final program in a series we called Learning from the Past, Fighting for the Future, Reflections on 2020. While the program was stopped short, I think you'll agree that our guests gave us plenty to think about. And in just a minute, you, our listeners, will have an opportunity to add your own thoughts and questions to the conversation. But as we close out this series and say goodbye to 2020, I wanted to mention the other conversations we've had as part of our look at this year. You can find them along with all the programs recorded during the pandemic here at the Eastside Library at our Eastside Freedom Library YouTube site. Back in June, we talked with uh, Ricardo Levens Morales for the uh, kickoff to the series. Ricardo is a um, artist, a uh, longtime movement veteran, and a person who's worked very, very closely with emerging movements and people uh, who have joined movements, younger people in particular. He's become kind of a mentor for, for uh, generations of movement activists. And we talked about a uh, talk with him at that time, just as the um, Black Lives Matter movement was kicking in again in reaction to the um, death, the killing really of George Floyd. It was a wide ranging discussion and a great introduction to what social movements are all about and what happens to people when they get involved and how people can maintain a, um, a uh, long-term uh, involvement over time. It was a great and very inspiring talk. And I really, for those of you who haven't heard it, I really highly recommend it. Then in July, we looked at uh, specific, or first in specific issues that have been the result of this um, uh, recession. What is happening to renters and tenants, folks who um, are having uh, trouble uh, paying the rent? And we looked at some movements and some ideas that have really expanded the repertoire of what uh, tenants can do when they organize for power. And we call that session, uh, Give Me Shelter. And we had as our guest, Professor Amanda Curran, who'd written a great book about housing cooperatives in the capital city of Washington, DC, 
where low and moderate income tenants actually own their own buildings and are able to keep the rent at a rate that they can afford, a great alternative to um, a private landlord-centered housing system. And we also talked with uh, Jennifer Arnold, who's a co-director of United Renters for Justice, which is uh, an organization um, largely of Latinos in Minneapolis who are just actually organizing after a rent strike to own their own building uh, along the lines that Amanda was uh, writing about. So we had an author and an organizer in conversation. And we also talked to Alexa Zangi, who has done some great research and writing on rent control. Another approach that's been largely off the table, but which is um, a promising um, uh, approach to stopping or at least slowing down the growth of um, uh, rental prices. In August, I wanted to look at public health because one of the things that struck me was how front and center public health and public health workers and the whole idea of public health has become during this period of time. And in thinking about this program, I was hoping that one of the uh, benefits, if you can call it that, of this crisis we've been through would be a new uh, understanding and appreciation of public health and public health workers. And we certainly got that, but we also got a lot of pushback and opposition to public health and public health workers. And so we talked to Michael Westerhaus, who teaches at the University of Min uh, Minnesota Medical School and who is a clinician himself and has been part of a global movement called social medicine and worked in, um, in developing countries all over the world. It was a really uh, great discussion about the relationship between social life and social causes and social uh, remedies to what we oftentimes think is individual medical problems that have to do with things like disease and our individual selves. And he had great uh, stories to tell, but also great perspective. And um, I think it was an important conversation to have during 2020. In September, we switched, guess what, to politics. And we in invited and had a conversation with John Nichols, who is the one of the political uh, writers for the Nation magazine. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, also very involved with Progressive magazine uh, that was started and still uh, comes out of our neighboring state of Wisconsin. John Nichols has written a lot of books about um, politics from a progressive point of view, a lot of articles as well. And we wanted to talk to him about his latest book, which um, was called, or is called, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. And it's the story of Henry Wallace, who was vice president for Franklin Roosevelt uh, from 1940 to 1944. Um, and almost became the uh, nominee for um, uh, president um, with the death of Roosevelt in 1945. But at the 1944 uh, Democratic Convention, he was replaced by none other than Harry Truman. In one of those great conversations um, one could have, what would have happened if a progressive probably the most progressive vice president and one of the progressive, most progressive national leaders we have had in Henry Wallace had actually become Roosevelt's uh, vice president again in 1944 and then acceded to the presidency. Wallace was a critic of corporate power. He was a critic of what he saw as the emerging post-World War II um, Cold War and the growth of a military industrial complex. Uh, unfortunately, um, that's not what happened. But in looking at Henry Wallace's career, we look at the ongoing struggle within the Democratic Party between populist progressives who, who see an expanded role for government and an expanded role for citizen organizations and labor and farm organizations and a more equitable distribution of wealth. That's what Henry Wallace represented in much the same way that maybe people like uh, Bernie Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez represent today. It was a great conversation for those of you who like politics and like political history and like to think about where we're at in the struggle for how to move progressive social change forward, I highly recommend it.
And then we uh, skipped October and went to November and talked with Barbara Fries. Uh, she's an environmental uh, lawyer who wrote a fascinating book called Industrial Strength Denial, Eight Stories of Corporations Defending the Indefensible. And so she looked at uh, a number of case studies, ways in which corporations defended their own behavior um, by basically denying it. And it got me to thinking and several conversations about denial uh, more generally um, in American society, uh, not only in corporations and uh, probably worldwide, in the way in which we can sort of turn our um, eyes, revert our eyes to things that really we need to be grappling with. It was a fascinating discussion, important discussion, and I also recommend that. So you can again see or see and listen to all these conversations. They're part of the Eastside Freedom Library's commitment to looking at history and the present. And so we get a better understanding of what's happening and forward together, uh, uh, go forward together to uh, make uh, for a more uh, just world. And so now let's turn to the discussion we had. I hope you agree with me, a really fascinating discussion with um, our three historians. And I um, encourage you to think about some questions you might want to ask. I'm going to actually um, mention a few that I was hoping to get at before the power went out. We were just discussing um, the um, real uh, uh, emphasis placed on, uh, on, on the importance of learning about our own history as it relates to race here in the United States. It's been one of the outgrowths of the social movements that have come out of um, this latest uh, approach for black uh, and, and racial equality. And um, I was asking uh, Shannon uh, about how that discussion was going in her classrooms, and how students were reacting and uh, by implication of broader society to really engaging in the history of racial inequalities uh, in this country. Uh, so we can better understand the present and how to move into the future. That's a commitment the Eastside Freedom Library has made from the beginning and we will uh, continue to make. And that's where our conversation got cut off by the power uh, outage. I also wanted to um, ask them about, um, uh, about the white working class. There's been a lot of talk about the white working class um, and what is a working class and is the white working class moving away from um, uh, progressive uh, politics? And um, what can we learn from history about the role of the white working class? And of course, the labor movement is part of that in, um, in politics and in a progressive movement. So that might be something you want to explore. Um, also, I wanted them to just take a stab at putting Donald Trump into historical um, perspective. What characters, uh, if any, um, does he remind you of? Have there been other examples of his style of political leadership? Some are called uh, uh, de um, demagoguery. Uh, and what, what uh, parallels can we draw? And um, I also wanted to talk about the uh, pandemic. I was an American history major and uh, didn't learn a thing about the great so-called Spanish flu, which was a pandemic in um, uh, 1918, right after uh, World War I. It was a, it was a global um, phenomenon. It was a horrific pandemic. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people died all over the world and many, many right here in Minnesota. Um, how come we didn't learn about that? How come that wasn't part of the history? And how come we didn't learn about the responses uh, that have been so uh, much a part of the story, the political responses, the social responses, the divisions uh, among people. Did this happen back in 1918? Um, or is it a phenomenon that we're just seeing today in 2020? So those were uh, some of the uh, questions that we would have got it into. And now I just uh, invite you uh, as part of our last in the series of reflections on 2020, to uh, ask your own questions. Um, you'll have an opportunity right now as we segue into the discussion period uh, of this program. And uh, what do you have to ask our uh, three um, historians um, about this year, uh, uh, this year that has been uh, truly 
uh, monumental. And um, hopefully we'll usher in uh, a year of progressive change in 2021. Thank you very much. This is Tom O'Connell, and it has been great to be part of this series.